See what I'm pulling up? See it? Okay. So what I was talking to about earlier, as far as particle sizes, uh, here's a pretty good representation of what those are. Uh, if you imagine uh, sand, if you, you can imagine how small sand particles are, this is kind of on an exaggerated scale, so you could actually fit, physically see them. Uh, sand particles are typically larger, silt drastically smaller. Uh, silt is, it's kind of, it feels almost like a flowery material. And clays, you, you can't really see those uh, with the naked eye. That's kind of a microscopic type thing. And clays, their texture is extremely smooth if you are actually texturing them with your hands. So it's kind of a, a visual representation of the, the size of those types of materials. Uh, there's all kinds of flow charts out there on like how you actually can texture. And more, more commonly, it's it's by the, the fingertip method because your fingertips are very sensitive. But basically, like you can kind of start and you make ribbons with your with your hands. Uh, the different types of uh, materials that make up soil, they will feel different in your hands. So you can kind of follow different flow charts to help narrow down and get a common nomenclature for each of the different varieties of soil that they are. And to further talk about those different varieties, they're often listed on what's called a texture triangle. And these are commonly uh, published across multiple avenues and across the internet. But basically, you've got your three different uh, constituents of soil listed here. You've got clay, you have silt, and you have sand. And basically, what you do is, um, if you're texturing with your fingers, you can kind of estimate the percentages of each of the different materials that you can feel. And basically, what you do is you use this chart to then plot where all the three constituents meet. And that will kind of give you a common name to be able to refer to that particular type of soil. So that if we're talking about a clay loam, for, say for instance, right in the middle of the triangle, people anywhere around the world would be able to tell, oh, that's about 50% of each of the different constituents. Or if you're just talking about a sandy loam, oh, you're talking about really low percentages of clay and higher percentages of silt and sand. So that's that's one way. Uh, of course, that's using the fingertip method. Uh, it's not recommended, but your teeth are also very sensitive. And uh, an old fashioned way were to kind of take up some soil and actually put it in your mouth and you can feel the grittiness on your teeth. You may not want to do that uh, method, depending on where you got that soil and, and what have you. But anyway, your teeth are very sensitive too. But uh, that's what some of my teachers always did is they would pick it up and they put a little bit in their mouth and they could tell with their teeth what the percentage of definitely what sand would be. But anyway, that's kind of a, a brief overview of uh, soil textures. Um, I guess I can pass it on to Hunter if uh, Hunter wants to talk about some of the uh, different soil horizons and how we categorize those. Hold on one moment. Helps to click on the right window. All right, so I'm gonna cover a little more than just um, horizon nation, but these are some broad categories that um, I think in terms of conservation districts, the Envirothon and general environmental knowledge are pretty important for us to understand. Um, in terms of soil conservation, soil science. So soil erosion is, you know, a huge part of what we talk about and do and deal with. So and there's three major parts or types of soil erosion that we are trying to control. 
and those would be real, gully, and uh, sheet erosion. So with real erosion, you know, those are the, the little fissures you sometimes find out in fields after they've been plowed or uh, after a good hard rainstorm or maybe a construction site, you'll see these little zigzag lines where the water is cut down through the soft soil and into a point where it's being restricted more by the, the material than gravity. And then for the gullies, you know, that's, that might be a situation where you've got a collection of these small rills, or maybe you're in more of a drainage position. And after uh, severe removal of vegetation or some kind of ground cover, it's allowed all that water to collect in those areas and cut down uh, rather than be absorbed or moved slowly. And then it's really hard to find a picture of sheet erosion because sheet erosion essentially it's happening to some degree on every sloping surface. Um, but it's important to remember that with ground cover, whether that be straw um, scattered on the ground on a construction site or grass or hay or, or your yard, all those things reduce uh, sheet erosion dramatically. And, you know, it's, it's over 99% reduced if you've got I believe the number is 80% ground cover. Um, so it's important for us to, to maintain those things. All right, moving on. Uh, something else in general soils knowledge that we should all have a, a good grasping on is using web soil survey and reading soil maps. So soil maps are probably the quickest and uh, easiest way for us to get data without going out and digging a hole somewhere. Um, these are not meant to be used on a very small scale. When these maps were created, they were, uh, I believe, from old mappers that I've talked to, it was like one auger hole per like 100 acres in some spots. It was, it was a very big unit. Um, so those guys got really good at reading landscapes and knowing what soils they would find there. So looking at this map, uh, you can see a series of 16s. There's some 17s, a 49. 42, a 55, and then they all have these letters behind them. And letters behind a number generally are indicators of slope class. And so a smaller letter, if we want to say A is small, would mean it's a flatter surface. And the further you get into the alphabet, the steeper the slope would be. And you can kind of see that by the, the uh, table to the right showing slope percents, you know, for an A slope, zero to three percent, down here at E slope, that's 25 to 45 percent slope. So there's a lot of water moving off of that surface rather than being absorbed. Um, all right. Soil water. So a significant portion of the ground is composed of water, actually. Um, some people say between, I think, 20 and 30 percent, but I, I believe that's pretty varying depending on, you know, what type of soils we're dealing with. But it's important to understand that permeability in a soil doesn't just denote water moving through it. It's the ease for all things to move through your soil. And particularly if you if you were to dig a hole and you saw roots growing down through a soil in a profile, and then you saw the roots turn left and right, you know wherever those roots are starting to turn, water's doing the same thing. So you're probably going to see some maybe perching in those areas. Um, so in that picture on the left, you, you can see you know, precipitation comes down, permeates. Um, there's a difference though in permeability and infiltration. So infiltration is the speed at which water can move through a soil and that's measured in a unit. So soils that stay wet for a long time, they, they have what's called glade colors and if you were to open a soil color book, there's these numbers and they're chromas. And so if you're a four, two or less in colors, you get these really, you start getting grays and blacks. And those grays and blacks are showing you where the soil is so wet, it's actually stripping the color and the irons and the manganese off the soil particles and leaving them bare. So if you look at that picture on the right, that's a wetland soil. So as you move down, you're getting less and less color and it becomes more muted. And that's, that's due to the water saturating the soil for long periods of time. Um, as 
as a soil conservationist and an organization that prizes itself in that, uh, compaction is definitely something we're always fighting. And with agriculture, we're driving big, heavy equipment out on fields, but it's important that we think about when we're driving this equipment over fields, because once you compact the soil, it is really hard to undo that destruction. And it's one of the many anthropogenic forces that we pose on the earth. So soil has structure and in that structure, it can be very small and single grain and sands or very large if it's uh, like platy or block, like uh, blocky, but massive structure. So generally those upper horizons where everything grows. And if we compact them, we take that soil and make it into a giant block. And it's really hard for roots to grow down through that, that massive soil, like I mentioned earlier. We can do things to help with this though, like not driving our equipment out on fields when it's wet or uh, planting crops intentionally to break up that soil with large tuberous roots. Um, these are good conservation practices that we can implement and should be aware of. Uh, general soil chemistry, right? So we have our micro macronutrients, they're listed at the top, M, P, and K, but there's a whole list of other nutrients that are in the soil and plants need, and in too high of levels, they become toxic. So soil nutrients are only, only as good as your pH is. And if you don't have your pH in a proper range to make those nutrients available, it doesn't matter how much M, P, and K you have, if you've got a pH of 4.5, those nutrients can't be taken up by the plant because they're bound to the hydrogen ions on clay particles. And so until you get the pH in that mid range, um, it's really hard to really take full advantage of what you're putting down. So it's important to, to always manage pH before you really start applying other nutrients um, to, to take advantage of what you have at home. Uh, so I think, oh, and of course, her horizons that we started with. So these are the major master horizons, excluding R. So O is the thin organic layer on top. A lot of places we don't have an O horizon. You really only find an O horizon in a forest setting where agriculture really hasn't occurred before. Um, there can be a thin one after that, but they, they tend to leave pretty quickly. They get disturbed. An A horizon, which is your, uh, your surface, you know, so this is where most of your biological activity is going on. This is where most of your growing is going on. It's where the bulk of your nutrients are going to be held. Um, it's what allows life to exist on earth and for us all to eat. Uh, your B horizon. So this is all your subsoil units and B horizons form both from the top and the bottom, depending on what kind of uh, soil forming climate you're in. Uh, there's a variety of B horizons. They're not all created equal. Some of them are very young in terms of geologic age, which could mean a million years old. Other are, well, yeah. Others could be extremely, extremely old and very highly weathered. And there are these bright, pretty red colors. And, uh, and then you have others that have salts in them and crystal structures and you have B horizons that have these big iron deposits that that you can actually melt down and turn into what they would call bog iron uh, and then C horizons so there's really one or two major C horizons in Virginia but generally once you get to a C horizon you're, you're in a situation where you're dealing with residual materials um, from the bedrock so some people don't consider it soil, some do, but it's not got the structural development that a B horizon would have. And then generally we consider an R horizon below a C horizon, and that is just bedrock. That is, uh, it's hard. If you hit it with a hammer, your hammer bounces off, you don't dig anything. In. So that's my quick and dirty soils lesson uh, at 40,000 feet. And I think Brandon and I would be happy to entertain questions at this point. Awesome. Thanks, Hunter. That was a pretty, yeah, quick, quick and dirty, if you will, kind of the overview of 
some basic soil principles. Uh, one of the things I always like to talk to kids about and uh, I bring up is the word dirt. Like dirt is very commonly used to describe soil. Soil is not dirt. Uh, you know, dirt is what's underneath your fingernails or it's, it's what's behind your ears. You know, if you've been outside and you've, you've got sweaty or you've mowed the yard or something like that, like you feel dirty, but you don't say that you feel soily. You know, soil, we wouldn't be here as a society without it. Uh, most, if not all of the life on the planet wouldn't be here without it. It, it supports life. That's kind of the, the dividing line and the, and the kind of makes the importance of soil is that it supports life. Uh, life on the planet wouldn't be here. Us as a society, everything that we consume or we use is either mined, grown, or cut from the soil. So that's kind of our job as conservationists to educate about that, about the importance of it, and then to try to implement and discuss with uh, the agricultural community different ways to try to preserve that and keep it on the farm. Because as we just said, the soil is important. And I mean, if we have livestock producers or you're, you're growing something, you're not really able to grow anything if your soil is eroding away like it was in those first pictures that Hunter showed. Erosion is a natural process, but it can be made worse by certain activities. So that's a big part of our job is just to educate and then also to come up with different uh, land use options to try to keep the soil there so it can be productive for us. Yeah, so has uh, anybody got any questions or general comments or anything? Both Hunter and I, we have a soil background. We've worked with soils professionally. So we like talking about it. Probably too much. <laughs> I have a question. I have never heard of sheet erosion. Is that what, I mean, I, I've just never heard of that. So can you explain, is that like a, like a sheet that just kind of of topsoil that goes away or? I, I, can you explain that a little bit more? Excellent question. So, Hunter, if, if you don't mind, uh, I may say something. And if you want to jump in and say some things, too, um, if you think of uh, a landform and say, for instance, you have a gentle slope. If you look out at your yard or you look out on an agricultural field, it's not completely flat. It, it may have some some topography to it. So if you imagine uh, a rainfall event. Uh, let's say like a one inch rainfall that participation will hit the ground and then it will basically flow over the surface of the ground and it will act as a quote unquote sheet. It will flow with the landforms. So basically it's, it's, uh, it is that the water that's produced by that rainfall event that is then flowing over the surface as it was a, as if it were a sheet. Hence the name, the sheet flow. Okay. Yeah, sheet flow, it, it's, it's the easiest one to control. <clears throat> and it, it, it's going on everywhere to some degree, whether that's carrying, you know, the soil off of your, your truck tires down the, the road, or if you've got a big open site from uh, construction, it's going to carry a lot more than that if you don't have some form of ground cover on it. Um, Okay. And it doesn't necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing when it's uncontrolled. Yeah, like, like what Hunter said, it's usually the first step in the erosion process. It's, it's one of the first steps, I guess, that we should say. And um, whenever sheet flow is, it's usually, that's what starts to, uh, in, when we talk about the erosion and, and sedimentation process, those particles that, that I talked about earlier, those are what is actually eroding away. The, the water that is actually flowing, pick up those particles with it, transport it somewhere else, and then deposit it. That's, that's the, the process. And that's ha what's happened on the planet for uh, 
the billions of years that the planet has been around, that's how the geology has actually occurred as far as sedimentary. That process is, is a natural process and one that happens. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the beginning one. And then once uh, sheet flow, you've got a couple of different forms of erosion. And then it basically that they're all kind of worse versions of the sheet. So they all kind of get, the, the process just kind of gets, as water speeds up, it becomes uh, more erosive. And then that's where usually you start with sheet and then you've got the real erosion that Hunter showed in his slides, little tiny furrows that start to open up. Once the water hits those and starts to speed up and get faster, it removes that material faster and those just keep growing exponentially. So is it a that doesn't have any like ground cover? Did I understand you to say that? Is it a place without plants, just the soil or could it have plants on it too? Sheet flow can happen anywhere. If, if you imagine a parking lot and after a heavy rainstorm, you can, if it's got a slope to it, you can see the, the ripples of water flowing down slope. So gravity is pulling that water across it. That's a, a flat surface. Sheet flow can happen with, with ground cover or not. The erosion tends to happen when the vegetation has been removed. Gotcha. In a short period of time, that's when you really see the effects of sheet flow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Any more? All right, Mr. Lawson says none here. So is this everybody's uh, first time dealing with the Envirothon or is, do we have veterans of it? This is my first time. I'm a co and co-coach with our ag teacher at our high school. We're doing it together here in Cumberland. Awesome. Well, thank you. Glad you, <laughs> glad you joined. Well, yeah, we don't know what we're doing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> it seems I have an interest in all of it, so that's great. But I'm hoping to be able to expand it next year when we can hopefully actually meet again and do like a, a like a wildlife club and take the kids camping and and that kind of thing to expand it a little bit more. You're exactly right. Uh, I did. I was never in Envirothon, unfortunately, growing up. But uh, now being a part of it, uh, kind of an outside accessory role, the, the digital format, unfortunately, is a necessary, you know, it's, it's just part of the times that we're in now. But uh, it definitely takes away some of it. But at least the information can still get out there. That's but, right. uh, you know, hopefully it'll still be a good experience for you and it'll want you to continue. And I think Mr. Lawson, he has... Uh, he has just said that he's been in it with for about three years. He says he hasn't had a normal yet, but <laughs> he's still kind of learning, but it's still a good thing. You know, like you have to start somewhere. We have to start learning and, uh, and try, tr try to get into the groove of it. Uh, hopefully it will reach a level point. Hunter has actually been through the Envirothon program as a student. Oh, cool. Yeah, almost 10 years ago now, which is kind of actually <laughs> the first year will have been 10 years ago. So it's kind of scary now to think about. But yeah. Wow. So advice, I would like to ask any advice that you would give, give us, JD or, or Hunter, how to kind of the best way to prepare the students. Um, when I was there, we had a team that about half of us were friends and the other half, um, they were ex excited and interested on not being in class so much. And the three of us that knew each other very well, um, we, we worked our tails off studying and we really liked content. 
we found out that the two that just wanted to get out of class, one was an amazing artist. Mm. And so we were able to use his extremely fast and good art skills to do any type, any type of presentations that had to be like done in the moment. We always had the prettiest boards or posters or whatever. And he was, he was cool with that. And the other girl come to find out was a wonderful public speaker. So it really worked to their strengths. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Mr. Lawson just typed in uh, building a sense of team, you know, teamwork is important. Uh, it's important in everyday life. You know, Hunter and I, we're lucky that we, we actually work at the same district. So, you know, we consider ourselves a, a conservation team. And, you know, it's, it's, it'd be like sports or any, I, I didn't play sports in high school. I was in band, so I would consider that a pretty good team. But just having a, the camarader, camaraderie there, of course, having to be distant, that, that kind of, that makes that another step that's hard to uh, to try to get that team kind of feel. But um, having everybody, just like what Hunter said, kind of on, at least on the same page, as far as like having some general interest in it, uh, seeing other teams before at, at previous competitions, you know, like you can tell the ones that are, are really on it and they, they, they work together and some kids will have uh, strong suits in some fields and, that, that person will step up and they'll kind of be the lead at that particular group. And then they may rotate around and it's pretty interesting to see the different dynamics that can show up. But um, uh, I think it, it, part of it starts too, you know, with a good, with a good and interested coach. And I had, you know, teachers growing up that you, you looked up to and that made it all the better seeing that as a role model to want to then participate and, gain all the knowledge that I could. Yeah. And then too, you know, uh, using us as a resource. Um, we may not know the answer to every question, but we can, uh, we work in a field and that we have lots of different partners. And if there is a question that comes up, if, if we don't know it, we can get you that answer. And I think just mm -hmm. being involved and engaged with especially, you know, your, your local conservation district, but also uh, our partner agencies in RCS and uh, Department of Wildlife Resources, um, all those people, that they all like to talk about, most of them, I would say, like to talk about what they do and uh, they have their own individual interests. Yeah, we've had with our partners, with our soil and water and with other people coming in, the biggest challenge that we've had is that we are having to do some of it virtual, some of it in person. It's really hard to get a team, you know, feel like a true team. So, you know, we just figure we're going to do it and hope for more in person next year when we know more and, you know, just going to do it and see what happens. <laughs> That's a good attitude to have. <laughs> this, I mean, like that. <laughs> I'm gonna do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I mean this this format is still like it's still like new to me, and uh, just trying to get familiar with the operations on how to actually use the platform. You know that that's kind of the one hurdle, and then the other thing is like okay, let's you know nail it down and let's actually be. Uh, as efficient with our time as we can with with what information so it's, it's a challenge uh you know i know uh, what working with the soil and water conservation districts i mean you know we have statewide meetings often especially on this platform and you know you can still kind of get that cohesive feeling um once you once you get the initial kind of awkwardness of learning the program out of the way and then you can let the, the meetings and the information kind of start to flow yeah. Well, any other questions or uh, comments? Um, did the information that uh, Hunter and I shared, it, do you think that that would be useful for your team members? Um, do any of them have like an interest in soils or anything like that or? 
Well, for us, I feel like I'm taking too much time. I feel like that um, we we that's the one area where we don't haven't found that teen expert yet. We've got an, somebody that has identified themselves and an expert in every other area, but not soil. So that's, I guess, where we'll have to we just see you know, just see what happens. Well, if it's uh, any soulless, whenever I was in high school, I absolutely hated soils. And then when I went to college, I pretty much only studied soil. And mm -hmm. then I worked for a couple of years professionally as a soil scientist. So there's a weird cycle from, I don't know anything about this too. It's the only thing I want to know about somewhere in there. Right, right. Life is kind of like that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> It definitely helps to, you know, to, uh, I think to, to get out there and, and soils is, it can be a, a fairly dry subject to try to talk about. And it really takes like a enthusiastic person to try to make it interesting. And it really helps to be outside. And I don't know if it would be a possibility to, you know, to try to do that distance, but uh, to look at soil pits and, you know, people can look in their own backyards at, at soils and, and you can turn over rocks and there's, there's different opportunities to take a look at it. You can take a look at road cuts in, in and around your vicinity and look at different colors. Usually the first thing you notice is colors and just how that they can change in a pretty short parameter around where you are. And then that sort of can lead uh, into asking other questions about, well, why are they different colors? So why does this look really sandy as opposed to different things? I mean, that's talking about texture, like what I talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, it may be one where maybe not one single person, but uh, maybe if one particular aspect of um, one particular sub-discipline of the, the broader discipline of soils, maybe if they can work as a team and you know one person maybe get more familiar with the texture uh, triangle or like what Hunter was speaking about more of the on the agronomic side and you know if, if they're into plants and and in trees maybe the uh, that portion of it would be more interesting to them so but again you know you we are happy to be a resource if if anybody has any other questions about it or to try to further any kind of educational avenues for them, we're happy to try. Okay. Well, I haven't seen anybody else join our group, but yeah, I mean, if anybody after this, I, I would assume that I mean, if, if everybody is in agreement, I guess that we can stop the recording and uh, we can let everybody go on to the other groups if, unless anybody has any other questions. I don't. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank y'all. Yeah, thank y'all, everybody. I hope that uh, you learned something. And yeah, if we can help out in any way, please don't hesitate to holler at either myself or Hunter. <laughs>